Hello and welcome back. Now, somebody has called me out on walking one of my dogs when it was too hot. So what I want to do in this video is look at what the sign says, and it's probably not what you think. And hopefully this will be useful to a lot of you guys who are into the outdoors, because quite often we are dog owners as well, and you know, knowing the dangers of heat when it comes to dogs is potentially you know, a life-saving thing. So hopefully you'll find this interesting. Now, rather than look at kind of Facebook infographics and memes, I am gonna base all of the information on this on academic research, and I'm gonna to refer to a paper, which I'll link below, and it was actually written by three lecturers, two from the Royal Veterinary College and another one from the Rural College of Scotland. So you can be sure that this article does have credibility, uh, you know, and it is based on research rather than opinion. Now, the vets in question, what they did was they looked at the patient records of just over 900,000 UK dogs, and from that, they identified 1,259 cases of uh, heat stroke injuries in dogs. So it's a fairly good sample there. You know, it, it's a good sample of information, so it, it's statistically relevant. And what they found from delving into the information more was that most cases of heat stroke aren't caused by heat alone, they're actually caused by exercise. And that was the case for 74.2 cases of those, so 74.2% of those uh, heat stroke injuries were due to exercise. I think it was something like 12.9% was due to the heat alone, and then there was like 5.2% was due to being locked in a hot car. Now, of that exercise, it wasn't always clear what that was. There was only a couple of categories. The biggest category by far was walking. I think that was, I'll just, I'll just look it up actually, so I've got the information in front of me. 67.5% um, uh, of cases was due to walking, but it wasn't clear whether that was walking off lead or on lead. And we all know if the dog is off lead when they're walking, then that's gonna be a much higher intensity exercise. They get a lot hotter. Uh, and that's kind of backed up a little bit by the other factor that they found was when they were dogs were doing really high intensity exercise such as cycling, and I assume that means the owner was cycling and the dog was running behind them rather than the dog was cycling, uh, but that was something like 31.5% of all cases were due to that. And because we know that there are many more people simply walking the dogs than there are kind of cycling and running behind them, that, you know, let, that lets us safely infer that you know, the intensity of the exercise is also an important factor. The higher the intensity, the more likelihood of the dogs getting kind of heat stroke. Now, as always, it's, it's not quite as simple as just exercise because uh, they also found that there was a lot more incidents of heat stroke in June, July, and August, and they are typically the hottest months of the year. So obviously, you know, the ambient temperature does play a part. It's not just due to exercise alone. Now, there are all kinds of variables we need to be aware of, such as the dog's breed, the dog's age, its weight, you know, how fit the dog is, and its conditioning to those sort of temperature conditions as well. But with all that said, you know, there's still a lot of interesting things we can take away from that study. And um, one of them, which I thought was a really interesting point, was that there's more cases of heat stroke triggered by exercise in March when it's relatively cool than it is through heat alone in August. So clearly, you know, exercise is something we really do need to pay more attention to. So how do we kind of use this information? Well, I think the first thing the study's shown is we definitely do need to be more careful in the warmer months because most of those, you know, heat-related injuries are occurring in June, July, and August, which are the, the warmer months. But what I think most people aren't aware of or need to be more aware of is just how big a part exercise plays because it is by far the biggest trigger of you know, uh, heat stroke in dogs than the heat alone is. And if you're throwing your ball or you, know, you get your dog to run behind you uh, when you're cycling, you know, that causes more deaths than leaving your dog in a hot car does. It's not a measure of probability because there's more people throwing the ball for dogs. There's more people, you know, letting the dogs run behind them in the cycle. But it's still a really important thing to be aware of that that is actually a bigger cause of death and a bigger cause of heat stroke 
been leaving your dog in a hot car. Interesting things to know. Now, there are lots of things we can do to limit the intensity of the exercise a dog's doing, rather than just stop it walking completely. Um, you know, one of them is you could put your dog on a lead. And if you've got a dog, you'll know, you know that there'll be a massive difference in how much dog is you're panting if you're walking along slowly with the lead or when they're kind of tearing around the bushes, you know, doing what they want to do. Another thing you could do is rather than you know, constantly be walking, you could just come to a shady place like I am now. I've got my dog, she's just behind me, just lying down. She has a little stiff when she wants to and she's not under the pressure to constantly keep walking, but she's outside, she's enjoying you know, the smells and the sounds. So she's happy and she's not stressed. I should say as well, before I get any hate comments, it's 19 degrees today, so there's no problem anyway in terms of heat. I think the second piece of research we can really put to practical use is knowing that not all dogs are the same and therefore they're gonna have different tolerances to heat than other dogs. And I think it's really important that we get to know our own dogs and learn what their thresholds are. And the way I do this is through observation. Uh, you know, you get to know the, the signs of heat stress and tell that apart from normal kind of panting after they've been running, which is perfectly normal and perfectly healthy. Um, and if you do that and also pay attention to what the weather conditions are that day, then over time you start to develop a good understanding of under what temperatures and sort of humidity you need to pay closer attention to your dogs. Now, for me, um, I have two dogs, they're both very different. I've got Bolt, who's half Husky. So he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Pomsky, so he's half Husky, half Pomeranian. Both of those breeds are originally bred as sled dogs because Pomeranians used to be a lot larger than they are now. And um, when it gets to just sort of 16 degrees centigrade, then I have to start paying really close attention to him because he will start to get heat stress for, for two reasons, really. One is because he's got that wonderful coat, which is designed to keep him warm in the Arctic. But for the second reason is he's a very energetic dog and he will just run himself into the ground, you know, given the opportunity. So I do need to pay attention to him. Nova, on the other hand, she's very different. She's a short-haired dog. And I don't worry about her when it's like 21, 22 degrees because she will just plod along at my side when it's warmer and she'll just pant. She doesn't ever really show signs of getting into kind of distress because she's, she's just kind of taken easy, which is a sensible thing to do. Um, you know, on the flip side of that, Nova, when we are, you know, in the cooler months, if we're sitting out in the garden, once it drops to about 16 degrees, she'll take herself inside because she's getting cold. And when we're walking and we're active, then when it drops below, say, seven degrees, she'll need a coat. Well, Bolt will go and sleep in the snow at minus three, and he's perfectly comfortable. So the dogs are very different, and you do need to bear that in mind. I think it's really important you do get to know your dogs. Now, that means that that question of how hot is too hot to take your dogs out, it's going to vary dog by dog. Now, because I have Bolt, I tend to limit in normal situations to about 22 degrees. Um, and I find that serves me quite well. He doesn't get heat stressed at that point, but he, you know, he, does, he does pants, and that, that's about the limit that's right for him. But you also have to look at the environmental conditions as well, because they also play a big part. Now, one of the walks I do, um, because of where I live, I can walk 10 minutes down to uh, my local lake, which is, it's 10 minutes away. It, I walk through a shaded woodland to get there. They can spend half an hour splashing around in the lake, and then we can take the long way back while they're still wet. And that's gonna massively reduce their chances of getting heat stroke. Um, so in certain situations, I will consider taking them out and say 24 degrees maybe. You know, if you know, there's water nearby, if we're at the beach, for example, uh, where there's a cool breeze and they can cool themselves off in the sea if they need to. And that's why I always say, you know, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't judge people who, who go out in warmer conditions than you are because you don't know the circumstances behind, one, behind what their dog's thresholds are, but also, you know, the circumstances that that person has. Now, I'm really lucky. I work from home. I've got a lovely garden. 
which is covered so there's the shade there they can they can hang around in the garden all day go to the toilet there and it's not a problem not everybody has that option okay uh, some people don't have gardens some people have a garden but their dog simply will go there and some people have to work, work shifts where they just have to go when they're free and, and you can't just leave your dog for 10 hours until it's cool enough because that in itself is a welfare issue so when you you know when, when you're in a situation obviously the walks you do they should be on the shorter side rather than running around in the heat and the thing is for everybody passing by is if, if you're walking past or in some cases driving past in your car you don't have all the information to make a judgment on that person's circumstances or that dog's threshold so it's best that you keep your opinion to yourself because you don't know what's going on and that takes me very nicely back to my story of when i was called out for walking my dog when it was too hot and it was too hot it was 27 degrees but the story behind it is that my dog had just had eye surgery and I had to take him back to the vet for a checkup. Uh, and with an eye, you can't, it's not something you can leave because if there's a debris still in there or there's infection, what will happen is the eye will essentially just melt, okay? So you do have to take him to the vets. And I don't drive. So what I'd done is I'd taken a taxi there uh, to get him to the vets. And it was a lot hotter in the taxi than I thought it was going to be. A bolt looked uncomfortably hot in there. So I thought, rather than put him through that again on the way home, what I'll do is I'll just walk him to the local park. We'll sit under the trees like this, where it's nice and shady, and then we'll just wait for two hours, and then my wife will finish work, and she can come and pick us up in our car, which is air-conditioned, and it'll be fine. Um, and the park that I was taking him to was literally like 100 metres from the vet door, and somebody still made a comment without, so without really kind of understanding what that situation was even though I was doing everything in my power for the welfare of my dog and doing everything I could to keep him cool. So I hope that was useful and I hope it makes some of you think a little bit and uh, if you did like this video please give it a like because it does help the channel and hopefully I'll see you next time.